Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is Robert Kramer, and we'll discuss the crisis in the Middle East. Kramer is professor of history at St. Norbert College, where he has taught since 1989. He is a specialist in Islamic movements in the Middle East and Africa, and teaches a variety of courses on the history of the Middle East. He is the author of numerous books and articles on the Sudan, including Holy City on the Nile. He has lived and traveled in the Middle East and in North Africa for many years, and recently was the keynote speaker at an international conference on the study of history in Doha, Qatar. He is also a former consultant to the U.S. State Department. Bob, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Kevin. Well, let's start with ISIS. Mm -hmm. That's a sure. hot topic these mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a major concern right now. Mm -hmm. um, can you provide some historical context? Where do they come from? Well, um, the group that calls itself now the Islamic State, um, formerly known as the Islamic State in Syria or Islamic State in the Levant, I should say, say in Iraq. Um, it's had a, a variety of names. Um, the idea for this comes from a number of places. First of all, obviously, they grew out of Al-Qaeda and that movement, which was a stateless movement in various parts of the world, seeking to create, um, I suppose, uh, in their view, a, a dominant Islamic world order ruled according to a very strict and narrow notion of Sharia or Islamic law. So ideologically, one can trace them back to bin Laden and al-Qaeda. And of course, bin Laden himself is only um, a more recent uh, personification of this kind of idea because this view of a militant Islam that needs to establish a uniform uh, and puritanical practice of Islam goes back really many centuries. So ideologically, we can trace ISIS or ISIL or the Islamic State back to bin Laden and then well before him. But there's something else. There has been um, this idea going back at least 100 years that the people of what was formerly Mesopotamia and Syria have something in common historically and culturally and have common interests. And when Arab nationalism became a very potent idea in the early 20th century, there was always a branch of Arab nationalism that espoused the need for an independent state of Iraq and Syria. And this was a secular idea, of course. It was not a, a religious idea. And it was an important idea at a time when the Egyptians, and the Turks and the Persians were also articulating an argument for a narrow kind of nationalism. And this was sort of a subset of the larger Arab nationalist idea. So we have this notion of common bonds between the peoples of what they would call greater Syria, that would be Palestine, Syria, and Lebanon, and Jordan today, and the peoples of greater Mesopotamia, which would be Iraq today having some common interest and the argument that they should have their own country. Well, you put these two ideas together and you get the background to the ideology of ISIS. But of course, what it leads with is the religious argument that they need to recreate the, the early Islamic caliphate and govern um, over a territory as a prelude to eventual domination of the, the entire Islamic world and in their view and in their hopes eventually a, a global Islamic civilization. So it, this is tied in with pan-Arabism and right. uh, so, I mean many of us have seen Lawrence of Arabia which right. was you know sure. beautifully you know photographed. Right. right. Um, I wonder how many people actually really understand the historical context of that other than the guy riding around in the desert you know getting yeah. a sunburn. Sure. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, well the story of Lawrence of Arabia is really the story of the Arab Revolt in um, World War I. And it's a time when the British are facing a very serious threat in Europe and um, are in danger of losing this war to Germany and, and its allies. And the idea was if the British, if the Allied forces could create a second front in the Middle East, and 
preoccupy the Ottoman Empire's armies there. It would relieve the British to then concentrate with most of their forces on fighting the Germans in Europe. And at the time, they were having to bring in a lot of colonial soldiers. These were um, mostly from India mm -hmm. to help safeguard the Suez Canal Zone, which of course was the lifeline for British access to India. And India, as we know, was the most important trading partner and colony for the British Empire. So the idea was that if they could create a second front and get the Ottoman Turks to be bogged down in the Middle East, then the British could concentrate on the real war, the really important threat to them, which was in Europe. And the Arabs, meanwhile, had already been talking about an independent Arab nation. And one of the most important leaders of the Arab revolt is a man who came from a very prestigious family. His background was as the, the head of the Hashemite clan. This is the clan of the Prophet Muhammad himself. And um, he, he was known as Sharif Hussein ibn Ali. He was probably, uh, he was the leader of probably the most important family in the Arab world. And he was both a very important Islamic notable, but also a very important figure in the Arab world in a secular sense. And he became the spokesman and leader of the Arab nationalist movement in World War I, he and his sons. And they became the leaders of the Arab revolt against the Turks. His view, his mission, I think, was to create an independent Arab state in what would be, I suppose, all of Arabia, which would be the territory between Egypt, Turkey, and Iran. Everything west of Iran or Persia, everything south of Turkey, and everything east of Egypt. Now, the reason for excluding Egypt was the realistic acknowledgement that the British were already established in Egypt. Um, and there was no realistic way that Egypt was going to be freed from British control and joined into a larger Arab nation. But Greater Arabia was a territory that at the time it seemed possible uh, to create an independent state. And the British and the French really uh, quite clearly made an agreement, the British in particular, with Sharif Hussein that they would grant him independent rule over this Arab state should the Allies win the war. And this gave the Arabs of Arabia the green light to pursue their revolt, which they did. So let's, you mentioned something about the uh, Ottoman Empire, right. and uh, you know, apart from uh, maybe uh, some story Alibaba and and, right. and some others, I think that most Americans have only a dim awareness of what that is. So um, in World War One, essentially, that was the defeat of the Ottoman Empire. Right. But sure. let's go back. How did where did the Ottoman Empire get started? Why was it important? Why do we care about it? Okay. Well, the Ottomans are um, one. The Ottomans are one Turkish dynasty among several, but it comes, it, it comes to be a dominant Turkish dynasty. There were a number of Turkish clans in what was then called Anatolia or, or Asia Minor. And the Ottomans come to be dominant probably in the uh, early to mid 14th century. And eventually they become the dominant power in Anatolia. And they take territory, they take some very important towns, and eventually, uh, in the 15th century, they gain control over Constantinople. Once they gain Constantinople, which is the gateway to Europe, and controls a very important um, waterway connecting the Black Sea to the Mediterranean, which is the, the Bosporus, once the Ottomans are thus established, they become um, the dominant power in the Middle East. They gain territory not only in the Balkans, which includes Greece, by the way, and southern Europe, but they also gain control over all of Anatolia and then the Syrian coast and eventually Egypt and North Africa and Mesopotamia. And they come to be an empire which rivals the largest Islamic empires in history. And in their height, in the 16th century, uh, the age of great rulers, Henry VIII um, in, in England. Um, we have uh, the Francis I of France. We have 
the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire. Uh, we have Martin Luther, you know, uh, unleashing the Reformation in Europe. This is an, an age of great kings and great rulers and powerful popes. And it's also a time of Ottoman domination. We have really two Ottoman sultans who essentially dominate the century. And the most important is a man named Suleiman, who's known in Europe as Suleiman the Magnificent. And he rules for a period of 44 years. It's a period of tremendous continuity and stability for the Ottoman Empire. And during their period of domination, which again is most of the 16th century, they are without a doubt the most important civilization in the world, the most important empire, the most important military force. They control trade between China, India, and the Mediterranean world. They control trade in the Mediterranean, which is known as the Great Ottoman Lake. They control the trade in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea. They have the most powerful um, army. They are regularly sending their army into the, the belly of Central Europe, attacking Vienna. Um, their armies cross North Africa and the Mediterranean. They are sending armies out into the Atlantic, naval forces into the Atlantic. And, and this is really their height. This is the height of the Ottomans, the 16th century. But everything prior to the 16th century had been building up to that. And then when they go into decline, they have at least three centuries of decline, which is why they're still around when the 20th century comes about. And it's kind of an amazing thing that in World War I from 1914 to 1918, the Ottomans are still relevant as a power. Now they're weakened, certainly, and they're very much manipulated by the Europeans, by the British, the French, the Russians, uh, and the Austro-Hungarians. But they're still there. They're still, in essence, controlling a lot of real estate, a lot of territory in the Middle East. So their legacy is kind of a mixed legacy. They had, at the greatest extent, maybe 600 years of power, um, the last several hundred years of which they are in decline. Um, it's a legacy of what was a surprisingly tolerant empire. The Ottomans ruled in a very tolerant way towards religious communities. They gave religious minorities among the Christians and Jews tremendous autonomy. They were essentially self-governing as people. They were free to move anywhere in the Ottoman Empire they wanted, which if you think about it means everywhere from Iraq into Turkey, um, all of Arabia, Egypt, North Africa, uh, a big portion of southern Europe, the Mediterranean world, and these people could freely go back and forth, settle where they wanted, open up trade relations where they wanted, and the Ottomans saw it as advantageous to give religious communities enough leeway that they could comfortably settle and do business. Not terribly dissimilar in some ways to the Roman Empire. They, they allowed largely free movement, I think, across there. And I mean, as an sure. economist, that makes for good, good, uh, good conditions for economic growth. Absolutely. And the Ottomans appreciated that to have a vibrant, um, set of trade relations with the rest of the world that would allow their economy to grow and expand, they needed to govern as loosely as possible. So they had a very laissez-faire kind of government. Essentially what the Ottoman Empire sought to do was defend the borders, extend the borders wherever they could, make sure that government was conducted fairly, meaning the courts of justice would function fairly. Um, uh, criminals would be uh, arrested and, 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 and prosecuted. Roads would be open and safe. Weights and measures would be stable and, and sure. Um, public health and safety would be maintained. But, you know, those are the fundamentals of government anywhere. Beyond those fundamentals of government, they did not look to um, insert themselves into the lives of their subjects. They allowed people um, to essentially govern their own communities according to their own practices and customs to whatever extent they wanted. And they really wanted to allow each region to 
develop its own economy depending on what the environment and the, the traditions would, would warrant. So it was a very successful empire. Of course, the problem with the Ottomans is that Europe begins to rise in a process of modernization, and they are, of course, caught unaware. And as Europe rises, the Ottoman Empire declines. Now, they were an Islamic empire, is that, yes, is that right? Yes, absolutely. So w when we think of um, Islamic you know, uh, movements today, especially the, the more fundamentalist ones, we don't necessarily think about uh, an open society right. in, in the same way. So um, maybe the way to understand this is, tell us a little bit about where um, Islam started. And, and mm -hmm. how, how did it get going? When was that? And what was the arc that led to, uh, led to the Ottoman Empire, you know, six centuries later? So. Okay, sure. Well, um, it's an interesting question you raise about Islam and political rule and tolerance because absolutely, um, people today, with the perspective of 2014, we look at the world around us and we are regrettably living in a time of tremendous polarization, of course, political polarization in our own country, um, a level of ideological and political division that I don't know that any living person in America has ever witnessed. And um, certainly this is fueled by the new um, media technologies that we have. Um, and of course, it's not just in our own country, but in the world as a whole. We're also, I think most of us, acutely aware that there seems to be a kind of civilizational conflict between the Western world, largely Christian and Jewish, and the Islamic Middle East and uh, other portions of the world, South and Southwest Asia, Southeast Asia. To a large extent, that notion of civilizational conflict is, uh, is a myth. Um, one can dismantle that idea without uh, tremendous difficulty. But the perception is that the West is at war with the Islamic world. And perhaps put differently, the Islamic world is at war with the West. The problem is, of course, that there are people who are extremists and militants in the Islamic world. And even if they're a tiny percentage of the Islamic world, we have to remember there's something like 1.4 or 1.5 billion Muslims in the world. They are easily a fifth of the world's population. They are the fastest growing population in the world. So even if it's a tiny percentage of the worldwide Islamic population, that's enough people, 10 million say, who seem to have an implacable hatred of the West. Now whether that's true or not is another matter, but nonetheless we know there are many Muslim people that clearly have a very serious um, argument against what they see as Western domination, and it's often expressed in religious terms as uh, Christian and Jewish domination. They use terms like Zionist and Crusader, things like this. But what that does, the, this present day and fairly narrow perspective of civilizational and religious conflict, what that perspective does is it diverts our attention from the greater historical sweep that you have referred to, which is a legacy of almost 1400 years of fairly normal relations between the Islamic Middle East and the predominantly Christian West, and essentially 14 centuries of tremendous tolerance in the Middle East. Well, I mean, Judaism and Christianity had a long head start, especially Judaism, sure. on, um, on uh, Islam. So how did, where did Islam come from? I mean, were the folks that were there, were they primarily uh, uh, polytheists, uh, were they, mm -hmm. what was their religion? What was, the, what was the world like when Muhammad changed it? Well, when Muhammad's um, career begins and he receives his first revelation in the year 610 of the Common Era, he's living in an Arabian world which is polytheistic. Um, the Arabs are divided into tribes for the most part, though there are some urbanized Arabs, particularly in his hometown in Mecca, 
And most of the Arabs worship a variety of deities. Uh, each tribal group has its own deity and it has its own shrine to that deity in Mecca, which is the main city, both a trading city and also a place of pilgrimage. We have the Packers in Lambeau Field. Right, here. exactly. <laughs> yeah. it, it was the, the, the polytheistic Arab version of, of Green Bay, I suppose. <laughs> Um, there were also, however, um, Jewish tribes in Arabia who were Arabic-speaking tribes that practiced the Jewish religion. And certainly there were uh, substantial Christian communities to the north in Palestine and Syria, and the Arabs were trading along the Red Sea coast with Palestine and Syria. So in Muhammad's time, he would have been living in a pagan or polytheistic Arab world, but he would have been in fairly frequent contact because of long distance trade with Christians and Jews. And he was himself a merchant. He was accompanying caravans on a trade route that linked Yemen and Syria. So he would have had a lot of exposure to these Christian and Jewish communities. Now, shortly after his death, right. there was a split. Exactly. And I mean, that, have ramifica that has ramifications now. Right. Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Sure. Well, Muhammad dies in 632, and he did not name a successor um, for reasons that are unclear. And, of course, there is a political struggle among his followers over who will lead the community in a, in a political sense. And um, people being people, there are factions, and each faction has its own set of interests. One faction is the faction of Ali. Um, Ali was Muhammad's cousin and also his son-in-law. He had married Muhammad's daughter. And this faction insisted that only someone from Muhammad's family, the Hashemite family, should be governing the Muslim community. However, the majority of Muslims felt that any able leader could be chosen to succeed Muhammad as the head of the community. And that's the group that won out. And they elected a man by the name of Abu Bakr to be the successor or the caliph and to govern the community. And so Muhammad's family, um, the, the party of Ali, comes to be a kind of political opposition force. Now eventually Ali will come to power as the fourth caliph or successor to Muhammad. But he has a very short and tragic reign, and when he dies, he dies a death which is considered a martyrdom. More importantly, Ali's son, Hussein, takes up his father's cause, and when he is killed, he will be the great martyr figure for that political movement, which will then transform itself from a political party into a religious sect. And these are the Shiite Muslims that we know today. So their origin is, as a political movement, they become a religious sect of Islam, and they develop their own ideas about the governance of the community. But in, in actual theological matters, they're not so far apart from the Sunnis. But martyrdom is part of the culture oh, and, and the heritage of what, what they have. And, and the folks who circle back that are in ISIS, that's where they come from, is that correct? Is well, no. ISIS is a mainstream Sunni community. Oh, it's a Sunni. Okay. Sunni community. So the main split in Islam is between the majority Sunni Muslim community, who always followed the majority view on who should govern the community, and then the minority group, which would be the party of Ali or the Shiites, who felt that, that power and authority should only be with the family, the Hashemite family of the Prophet Muhammad. Now, ISIS, or the Islamic State, they come from a very militant and puritanical branch of Sunni Islam, and in their eyes, Shiite Islam is not even a form of Islam, which is why their number one target from the beginning has been the Shiite Muslims. Mm -hmm. and, and Iraq had been ruled by, well, Ba'athist, but f from the Sunni side. Sunni side, yes. And when the debathification of Iraq happened after the war. Uh, the majorities, who were Shiites, were right. were put in charge, and they really shut out the, the Sunnis. Right? Exactly. So our invasion of 2003, um, which was intended to create a stable democratic state in Iraq, um, did end up creating a form of democracy. But of course, 
there is a majority Shiite population in Iraq, and so they did come to power. And the man who, as we know, became Prime Minister, Nouri al-Maliki, who has just recently stepped aside, uh, been replaced, um, he intended to govern by uh, keeping most power, not all, but most power in the hands of the Shiite community. And he did exclude the Sunni minority, which had historically been the authority, first under the Ottoman rulers, who were mainstream Sunni Muslims, and then under a number of Iraqi governments, uh, the last one, of course, being that of Saddam Hussein. So the Sunnis found, them, found themselves out of power as a disenfranchised uh, minority, disempowered minority, and that has led to all of the troubles in Iraq today and has created the environment which allowed ISIS to emerge because they have been feeding on the, uh, the bitter sense of discontent and disenfranchisement felt by so many Sunni Muslims in northern Iraq. Well, I wouldn't be doing anybody a favor if we didn't touch on another subject here, it's something that is in your wheelhouse, Sudan. Sudan. Which is not really an Arab, uh, it doesn't share the same history and the same heritage. So most of us sort of, I think, know about Sudan as a, as a as a tragedy, mm -hmm. uh, maybe wouldn't we wouldn't know about it if it weren't for George Clooney. But uh, <laughs> exactly. can you tell us a little bit about what the right. what the issues were there and how that traces back to to some of this? Yeah, Sudan, which is as you know, Kevin, the country that I'm I'm mostly interested in in my, in my research and writing. Sudan is one of these countries that's on the frontier of the Middle East. Um, geographically, it is within the continent of Africa, but the northern half of the territory that we call Sudan, what was formerly the country of Sudan, um, has always been, or at least in recent centuries I should say, has been dominated and governed by a population which considers itself Arab. Now these northern Sudanese are Arabs in the sense of their identification. They speak Arabic. Um, ethnically they are a combination of the indigenous northern Sudanese population, which we call Nubians, who also extend north down the Nile into Egypt, but also Arabs, because Arabs began settling centuries ago along the upper Nile. And they came in as merchants and traders and holy men and teachers, and eventually established themselves through a number of uh, marriage relations with local Nubian rulers, and that gives us the dominant class of Sudanese people today. They are a hybrid people of Nubian and Arab, and their identity is wholly Arab. And they are, the country has historically been part of the Arab League. They have associated with the other Arab countries, such as Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya, Egypt, Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, all the rest, um, they consider themselves and are considered an Arab country. But of course, that helped um, perpetuate uh, difficult relations with the southern Sudanese, who are not ethnically Arab, who don't necessarily speak Arabic, who are not necessarily Muslim. And in fact, most of them are not Muslim by religion. And, of course, that led, um, in the last few years, as we know, to a split in the country um, into two separate countries, the Northern Republic of Sudan and the Republic of South Sudan. So Sudan is now two countries. Well, this is fascinating. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Okay. You know, we, we only have so much time, and, and uh, I could talk about this stuff forever. Well, I hope you've all enjoyed our show, too. Uh, until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. 